streaming, the streaming, streaming claims to my work. And streaming, streaming. No, I like speaking in a bad southern accent. Okay, let's see. I'm going to be talking as if I'm on thing to see if the sound and video are synced. No, that appears to be way off. <laughs> <laughs> delay. Yeah, you know, it's funny. There, there used to be a delay, and, I was, and it actually it, it wasn't doing the delay that it's supposed to have. And then I was like, oh, let me change it back to the old delay. But it seems to actually be a... Okay, here, talk on camera so I can like, look hey, at the camera so I'm like, seeing your lips too. Let me talk over here. And look at the camera and do it. Hello, my name is Bryce. I'm testing the audio and uh, video for this tasting. Oh, so yeah, I totally delayed way the audio off. after. So the, well, the audio was way after, which is actually funny because I actually set it to delay the audio. Yeah, I need to do like that. Let me just take off because it works. Maybe it's like. All right, how about this? Oh, wait, I'll be on camera in a second, though. So, uh, yeah, how is this working? All right, how about this? Oh, wait, I'll be on camera in a second. So, uh, yeah, how is this working? Pretty good. It's I'd a say. little off, though. Is, am I, is my voice after or before? It's think? almost spot on, I feel like. I mean, yeah. yeah, it's maybe like a tiny, like half a second off or either way, but I can't really tell. Like, meow. Meow. <laughs> 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 I thought that is pretty good, actually. Yeah. yeah. I, probably not worth, I mean, I can sit there and fuck with three hours, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's pretty spot okay. on. Sweet. Okay, so. Okay, what happens if I do. It's because <laughs> the color that's in the grape <laughs> goes into the that juice and into ultimate. Let's see here. Yeah. Yeah. Look like grape there and then they add a they add a yeast to it. And it will squeeze the juice out. Using, using this, I didn't turn it right off. Yeah, I thought it was the wine. I wanna tell you a story, the only way. Yes, that I can just replay. Cool, so there's no like repeater or anything, no repeater, no repeater, 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 repeater. Sometimes it like still picks up the old audio of music or something. Okay, cool. Just keep in mind as well that actually once you're like cast about here, you're actually not on camera. Okay, so, so that's our, that's our, yeah, yeah, okay. Sh and should I have, should I be on this side then to like check the comments and stuff? Yeah, that, I mean, this that works. This work. And I'm kind of like here where I can fairly easy access that and I need to go fuck with stuff since I more or less know that stuff more. Mm -hmm. um, and I can be talking over here while you're there. Yeah, we're both on camera. Cool. cool. 
Sorry, lose a little bit more. Dog Hanky. That's <laughs> 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 really funny. <laughs> <laughs> We're just. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> Hurry! <laughs> is there any viewers? But funny is to know why that happened is because uh, oh man! Used to Hurry! Preview here. Is there it only went live once I clicked go live. But apparently now actually there's there's not a preview. Of this. <laughs> probably love it. Uh, <laughs> Because the purple color that's in the grape goes into the juice and into the ultimate. Let's see here. They put like grape there and then they add, a, they add a yeast. And it will squeeze the juice out. Using, using this thing yeah. to crank it down. Hey, may I add that into wine?
because the purple color that's in the grape goes into the juice and into the ultimate. Let's see here. Yeah. Put like grape there and then they add, a, they add a yeast. And it will squeeze the juice out using, using this thing yeah. to crank it down. They may add that into wine. Because the purple color that's in the grape goes into the juice and into the ultimate. Let's see here. Yeah. They put like grapes there and then they add, a, they add a yeast. And it will squeeze the juice out using, using this thing yeah. to crank it down. They may add that into wine. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? Welcome to our live tasting here on Facebook and YouTube. And for those of you who haven't watched before, my name is Kevin Luther. I am the owner and winemaker here at Voluptuary and Lucid Wine. And with me here today, I've got... Hello, I'm uh, Bryce. I've just started here working here about uh, four months ago. Um, I help over uh, here in the shipping department and in the cellar as well. Yeah. Yeah. So he does, uh, yeah, helps with winemaking as well as he hosts private virtual wine tastings on Zoom for corporate groups and small private groups. In addition to these public tastings, we do about 20 or 30 private Zoom tastings weekly for you know, private tastings in private groups, a lot of corporate groups and family celebrations. But for our public tastings, we love to do them themed around something. So our theme here today uh, is one of our favorite ways to do themes, which is working with a local nonprofit, the Wildlife Care Association here in Sacramento, doing amazing work, taking care of our wildlife, helping to rehabilitate them and, and yeah, take care of our fellow entities here on Earth. So um, so yeah, they'll be joining us. Debbie and Jennifer will be coming on camera lady, later with um, the their wonderful owl, whose name I've forgotten. Um, <laughs> but we have an owl and a snake coming on here later as part of our uh, yeah experience here tonight. So without further ado, we can start rolling into some of the, uh, the wine tasting here. And in front of all of you, you will have a tasting sheet like this. And that is going to guide you through the five wines we're tasting through. We have the full-size bottles here today. And many of you guys have your small wine tasting kits with the little mini bottles, either our two or four ounces. So the first wine is going to be the Chenin Blanc, the B10 Pollination Chenin Blanc. We're going to move our way down through the Rosé. We have a light red blend of Pinot Noir and Grenache. And then we have our Zinfandel and finally a darker style red blend our Wanderlust Red. So yeah, that being said, we can roll into the first wine here pretty much straight away. The first wine, like I say, is the V10 Pollination Chenin Blanc. So this is a really cool wine. It's from Chenin Blanc from technically Monterey area, but the exact location is actually in the Carmel. Again, it's called the Carmel Valley, but they're actually on a mountaintop. So Carmel Coastal Mountains, super cool climate. So this was actually picked in October, pretty late for a white wine, and yet at about 21 bricks, pretty low uh, sugar level with a lot of acidity. So this wine has a really crisp characteristic to it. And then along with that crispness, there's a creaminess and a richness you're going to notice. So for me, this is a really interesting mix of like citrus or 
early ripeness orchard fruit. So it might be like pear or apple, but it's crisper versions of those fruit with some citrus characteristic. But all of those fruit aspects intertwine with like a creaminess that's going on. So I don't know. What, what flavors are you getting on that? Yeah, I get a, kind of a lot of orange. And then you were speaking about that kind of toasty oak flavors. Um, mm -hmm. um, as long with like a lot of uh, kind of yeast derived kind of like surly aging mm -hmm, on that mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, so surly aging isn't like like mm, grumpy surly aging. That's surly's aging. It's from the, uh, for the French <laughs> for uh, aging on the yeast leaves. So when you age on yeast, you get this like champagne like character that adds like a creaminess, almond nuttiness characteristic. Definitely. So you're getting that like Surly's aging oak age style. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, a lot of like maybe like Asian pear. Um, just be more mm -hmm. specific with that pear note that you're that you're yeah. bringing up. Um, I like yeah. that that sort of uh, aromatic floral note almost to the pear. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So those characteristics, but you know, so like my notes here actually say pears and cream, creme brulee, candied apple, Meyer lemon curd. So it's all like crispness with creaminess counterbalance you're getting both aspects at the same time and then um all of this again is certified organic i didn't say this at the beginning but one of the big focuses of our winery here is that we are focused on organic and natural style wines and winemaking almost all of the wines uh, the grapes that i get are organic all but one vineyard i'm working with now are organic and all of the voluptuary brand are certified organic whereas the lucid brand is usually organic but not necessarily certified that's the one of the main reasons for the difference in the brands so uh we have a mix of the voluptuary and lucid this chenin blanc is fully certified organic from heller estates uh, they, they now call themselves moss estates but they're more historically known as heller estates really cool middle of nowhere vineyard and other than the grapes you know he was mentioning that surly's aging in uh oak it's aged in oak barrels like the ones behind us only a little bit of new oak flavor in there. It's mostly used oak, so it's not a dominant oaky flavor. It's just a subtle characteristic there. It's more about aging in the barrel and that time in, in the barrel that actually gives it, um, you know, so softens some of that bright fruit and gives you more of that richness over time. And then in addition to that, I used two other woods in here in very subtle amounts. I used acacia, which is similar to oak, but just a little different. It adds a little bit more of a floral note. And then I used a little bit of apple wood, which enhances an, a bit of an apple, um, yeah, pretty much apple note. <laughs> it's fairly straightforward on that one. Um, so those are the different wood aging influences. And again, as with all of our wines, this is organically made, sulfite free and vegan. All right. And then other than the, and, and oh, by the way, as you guys are hearing us talk about the wines, if you have any questions about the wines or want to make your own comments, uh, throw out your own flavor notes, or we're going to be talking about some pairings here. If you have your own ideas for food pairings or other types of pairings, feel free to throw those out in the comments section. While we're live, if you're throwing those comments out, we'll be able to answer that. Uh, Bryce will be keeping an eye on the comment section and we'll reply to those live. So, um, so yeah, as far as pairings go, the, um, I have a couple of different pairings. So we, we do food pairings, as is traditionally done with wine, but we also do music pairings, life pairings, and literary pairings. So we'll start off with the music pairing because you're like, oh man, these guys are boring. Drown us out, throw in some music, and you can just hang out and drink the wine to the music pairing. Um, my favorite pairing for this is the song One Day by Modest Yahoo. I think it just has a bright, upbeat, upbeat kind of uh, joyful feel to it that is a great match for the energy of this wine but another one if you're a little bit more because that's fairly high energy if this wine you know and that to me that matches the energy of that crisp acidity but if you're in a little bit more of like a chill mood kind of feeling that more creamy richness of this wine for the music pairing then the song aqueous transmission by incubus it's a super melodic like yoga it's like you'd honestly get a massage to that or something uh, or do yoga to it. So it's a really chill song. Uh, and then again, throw out your own music pairings. If there's a different song that you think would be a good match for this, throw that out in the comments. Then my life pairing for this is, um, oh, the, this for me is really like a baking hot summer or hot day in the kitchen kind of baking wine. 
I want to do like making some pies, making some lemon curd, making creme brulee, canning pears. You know, you're in a hot kitchen and you have this like chilled down the fridge, super refreshing to like cool you down amongst that hot kitchen. Uh, and feel free to throw out if you yeah. have any other pairings that you'd like. You're well, like, no, dude, that does that is not what I do with it. I've, I've never seen it before, but um, you know, because you can usually get blackberry rhubarb, strawberry rhubarb pie, but maybe like an apple rhubarb pie. I'm kind of bringing some more of that that tartness to the apples as well. Yeah, I'm just using green rhubarb. apples uh, in the pie. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's I like that. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of the life pairing and the food pairing at the same time. And then uh, lastly, my literary pairing is a. Um, an excerpt from a poem by Tony Hoagland in his book, his collection of poems, Donkey Gospel. <clears throat> yeah, it's a, it's a ridiculous name for a collection of poetry. But um, he says, a little dogwood tree is losing its mind, overflowing with blossom foam, like a sudsy mug of beer, like a bride ripping off her clothes, dropping snow white petals to the ground in clouds. So nature's wastefulness seems quietly obscene, it's been doing that all week, making beauty and throwing it away and making more. I don't know why, I just love the like natural sensuality of that. And this wine just like, yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, those are my pairings on that one. Yeah. Um, do you guys have any food pairings you would throw out? I know you can't respond, so. <laughs> send, them over, send them over my way. I'll read them out for everyone. Well, so that is that first wine. And before I roll into the second wine, I also just want to double check. Again, if you guys are having any trouble seeing us or hearing us, throw that out in the comments section. We can always make adjustments. But since I haven't heard any complaints or comments yet, I'm guessing it's all coming through smoothly. And then in the meantime, I also want to give a shout out. A lot of y'all viewing right now are from the McGeorge School of Law here in Sacramento. And I know that... Um, Kelsey Menifree uh, did a lot of organizing and was the first one to reach out to me. Thank you, Kelsey, for organizing this and getting so many folks to uh, support this great cause and as well as our little micro winery by joining this tasting. And I guess it's the uh, the wine club at uh, McGeorge School of Law. So kind of cool. And that's headed up by Professor Michael Vitiello. Vitiello. I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, yeah. He's apparently an awesome professor and is sort of the host for the their wine club. So thank you guys so much for joining us. And before I roll into my next wine, I got to crack a beer. It's a nice. palate cleanser. <laughs> Great Saturday beverage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think my favorite pairing for wine really is beer. Uh, we, we thought about doing a wine and beer pairing. Really? Where it's literally just pairing with each other. <laughs> <laughs> Have a beer, you just space them out. You beer, then wine, beer, then wine. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. I feel like this is the slightly mighty low cow IPA from Dogfish Head, one of my favorite breweries. Um, and it, it's just a really easy drinking session IPA. And I think that goes really well with a white wine, you know, sort of light, refreshing, hot yeah. summer day kind it of thing. Doesn't overpower it either. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it does work. So that's my beer pairing. <laughs> So, our second wine here is the L2 Urban Flora Rosé. So, to give context for this rosé, I'll explain one more thing about that first wine. That is a Chenin Blanc, but it's a Chenin Blanc made in the skin contact style, which some people call orange wine or golden wine. That's why it has a little more golden color than you're used to in a white wine. It's because it was fermented partly on its skins, which actually extracts more intense flavor into the wine, as well as a little bit of golden color. Well, when you think about that, yeah, you extract color from the skins into what is otherwise clear juice. Well, with a rosé, you get the color from the skins. And if you make a dark red wine, that's made by leaving the juice on the skin throughout the entire fermentation. Because the juice of a red berry is actually clear. And the skins are where all the color come from. So you really have to have that long skin contact for making a red wine to make a really, really light rosé, you separate the juice from the skins almost immediately to get a just the light color of the juice of the red grape, which is basically clear. To make a kind of dark pink light red rosé, you leave it on the skins for just a couple of days, like 48 hours, and you'll get a really nice like light, like I say, light red color, and also a lot of light red flavors, like strawberry, watermelon, cherry, hibiscus, I don't know. Those are some that I get all those fruit flavors, but are you getting anything else on this? Um, no, just three, like this big, 
watermelon's like the big one that I get on. Yeah. Um, kind of immediately that and cherry, um, for the fruit flavors at least. And then yeah, kind of get delves into kind of those more complex flavors derived from like that the barrel and some of that you know aging. Yeah, and he points out something uh, which is that after having it on the skins for a couple of days, we press this off either the tank or barrel initially, but ultimately it ends up finishing fermentation and aging in oak barrels. Uh, again, neutral oak barrels, so it's not like an oaky rosé, but it has that oak barrel aged flavor to it, where you get a little bit of that surly's aging, a little bit of that creaminess that's almost like cherry vanilla or something, mm. you know? But mostly it's fruit forward. You'd almost think it would be sweet, but you'll notice it's more crisp. You're getting more of this hibiscus cranberry kind of thing on the finish. And that's just because it is a crisper, higher acid style of winemaking. For rosés, you tend to pick the grapes a little bit earlier when they have more acidity than they would for red wine making generally. So, um, cool. That is basically the wine making behind it. And um, this is a mixture of Barbera, which is from up in the Sierra Foothills, mostly Cooper Vineyards, a really great Barbera vineyard. And then also a little bit of Pinot Noir and Muscat, uh, which the co-fermentation of those two together is where you get a lot of those light red fruits and floral aromatics as well. So, yeah, let's see. Roll into some of the uh, the pairings here. So my favorite music pairing for this, you know, I'm, I'm really torn between All the Time by Bahamas, which is just a really laid back, relaxed style song that I think matches the vibe of this. Or, you know, um, I've been recently doing some Lovely Day by Bill Withers because I think it has more of that like bright summer day that I, I feel like I would drink this wine on a hot day just you know, relaxing by the lake or the river or the pool with my friends, just in that hot day, relaxing in the sun kind of thing. But, you know, I feel like I have to give a, a at least some nod to my music pairing Comfortably Numb by Pink Floyd, mostly just because it allows me to make two bad puns in one song reference. Um, we're probably not comfortably numb yet, uh, but drink a few more of these and we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, and Kelsey actually had a good question. She asked oh. uh, what kind of oak we use um, to age the rosé in. Ah, so it is neutral oak primarily. So barrels which have been used already. And you're going to get very little oak influence on it. It's more like um, subtle vanilla creaminess you get from that more used barrel. But it's not dominant. It's not going to be smoky or oaky in that way. And it is, uh, the oak itself is French oak. So it's used French oak, which is generally considered more subtle. And then uh, the other thing I, I do with just a little bit of is after the oak aging or a little, sometimes a little bit in the barrel, I'll actually add a little bit of cherry wood, which that cherry wood adds just a little bit more of a vanilla cherry note. It enhances that slightly, but it's a very subtle addition. It's not dominant. It just adds a little bit to it. So yeah, good question, Kelsey. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I think that's it so the moment. far. Yeah, at the cool. moment. Um, so yeah, so those are a couple of kind of the, most of the pairings here. Um, oh, some food pairings. So one of my food pairings for this is watermelon bites. Which, uh, watermelon, mint, and feta, like together on a toothpick, just pop that bite in your mouth and you get that watermelon fruit that's really dominant in here. Plus that little bit of mint, there's like a subtle herbaceous note in this wine that I think more is like lemongrass, mm -hmm. but playing off that mint characteristic. Mint or basil, yeah. Yeah. Can, either one will kind of work with that. That um, sort of aromatic purple. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one thing I like to do with this one too, because this is actually my favorite wine that we make here, um, is take some sour beer and kind of go half and half with the sour oh, beer yeah. and this um, combined. Uh, back to kind of our beer so good. combos <laughs> and beer pairings. Uh, makes like a nice uh, spritzer almost. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things. We get a lot of comments that this wine reminds people of sour beers or almost like a really fruity style kombucha where you have all that fruit, but you also have a crispness to it and a little bit of funkiness at the same time. So yeah, super good as a spritzer. We started doing that. Like we have our four o'clock team tequila shots that usually result in beer after that as well. Uh, and so we started playing around with this wine with uh, with sour beers. It was a, uh, a really nice mix. And then I also really like this wine with tacos. I think... Um, just, you know, kind of fresh style California tacos and um, could be Mexican tacos, but I'm more familiar with the California style street taco status and especially fish tacos where you have fresh lime squeezed on top and that really refreshing style goes great with this wine. And on that note, my literary pairing comes from the author Tom Robbins and his book Jitterbug Perfume. 
And he says, never underestimate how much assistance, how much satisfaction, how much comfort, how much soul and transcendence there might be in a well-made taco and a cold bottle of beer. And, you know, I choose that quote because I think that wine has such a culture of this high-end fancy vibe where you just can't have fun with it anymore. And I think beer has like taken that role of being like the, the drink you can have fun with, enjoy with a taco and just enjoy that experience of like taco and beer pairing. Like why can't wine pair with tacos and just be like a relaxed environment? You know? A new thing, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that is the uh, literary pairing and, and that basically finishes up this wine. In a second here, uh, Yennefer is gonna come up and um, give us a, show us some of the wildlife uh, and talk about volunteering at the Wildlife Care Association here in Sacramento. But uh, as she's prepping to come up here, I'll just mention as well that that rosé you can find in Sacramento at the Sacramento Natural Foods Co-op. And all of her wines are available on our website. So if you're digging these, you can always order them off the website. Um, and yeah, oh, and then the last thing I want to mention as well is our art here. The voluptuary wine art is all from Robert and Shauna Park Harrison, wonderful artists off the East Coast who are hardcore environmentalist, uh, you know, activists in in the statements in their art. Check out them and their art and their website. And the Lucid wines all have art from Sacramento-based artist Micah Crandall Bear. Beautiful landscape stuff of natural settings. So both really, you know, believe in the cause and uh, great folks. So without further ado, uh, I'll uh, let Jennifer hop on and speak to the cause. Hello, I'm Jennifer. I'm the volunteer coordinator at Wildlife Care. I just want to say thank you for partnering with us and giving us the opportunity to show some of our animals. Um, this is a king snake, one of our ambassador animals. So um, if you are interested in wildlife care and just wildlife in general, um, snakes are often a misunderstood creature. They are portrayed as being very aggressive animals on movies, shows, um, but they're actually just a very defensive animal. So if you come across one of them in the wild, um, they just want to be left alone. So as long as you back away, give them the space that they need, they will leave you alone. So these animals are great for rodent control. They will eat rats, mice, any voles that they find. Um, some species of snake, snakes actually eat insects. So um, they can be great for your garden. So if you don't like slugs, grasshoppers, anything like that in your garden, snakes actually help reduce their population. Um, this king snake actually gets its name because they eat other snakes. So the only venomous snake that you can find in California is rattlesnakes. King snakes actually will eat them. So they, this is a constrictor species. So they will wrap around the rattlesnake and then they eat it. So that's not to say that rattlesnakes aren't great for population control as well. They are very um good species to have around you just need to give them their space and they will leave you alone so we're talking about just respecting these animals and letting them be in the wild and just appreciating the work and the role that they play in our environment the rattlesnake and they're and just then they eat really it cool so animals to look that's at. not to and say that rattlesnakes you are to hang out great with for our king snake control as well they are very very we're constantly um, looking for volunteers to have around. You just need to give them the animals space and they will leave you with alone. repairs, so, which is something we're working on right now. So if you are handy with tools and you want to help us repair our bird aviaries, we are looking for people to help. So you can always get a hold of us by going to our website or you can just send me an email at volunteer at wildlifecareassociation.com. Thank you. So cool. Thank you, Jennifer. Oh, wow. He's like... The snake is so chill. It's like, is he, is he real? <laughs> real. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, I had a friend growing up who had a snake, and that was one of those things, too. It was like, oh, man, they're so scary. It's like, no, they're actually really chill, like, as long as you're not, like, crazy around them. Like, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, cool animal snakes. So, um, yeah, definitely volunteer with the Wildlife Care Foundation uh, or Association. They're really amazing, the work they do, and they definitely need some help, need help and, you know, donations as well. I want to also thank everyone who has purchased these wine tasting kits. You know, $5 from every kit is going to the cause, as well as a lot of folks donated on our webpage, and we're matching dollar for dollar every donation there. 
And if anyone's seen this because it popped up on their feed on Facebook or YouTube, but you didn't actually get the kits, you can still get those and watch this later and still donate to the cause, still get those kits and have that go towards the cause. So uh, it's not too late ever. You, we, we keep those up on the website for another month or two after the, after the event so you can watch it later. All right, now let's roll into that third wine is gonna be the V4, the source Pinot Grenache blend. So this is a blend of Pinot Noir from a vineyard on the Bay Area side of the Santa Cruz Mountains, technically uh, within Portola um, area and really cool organic or certified organic vineyard. And it's only about an acre, but it, they, they grow some of the most wonderful Pinot Noir, super hand cared for. It's picked one cluster at a time by senior citizens. I'm not even joking. And they actually look through and pick out any grapes, individual grapes from the cluster that aren't perfect. It's one of the reasons the Pinot Noir by itself is $68. But in this blend, this blend is only $28, which is just kind of crazy. Um, and then the Grenache in this blend is from Calaveras County from a another really cool vineyard, uh, a Star Canyon Ranch. And... 100% certified organic, grown on limestone hillsides. And it just has this really like earthy, smoky flavor to it that is where a lot of the sort of smoky, spicy elements in this wine come from. The Pinot Noir contributes more of the cherry and black pepper to this. So the overall net result is a wine that has you know, some pretty cool aromatics going on, but as overall, these are still two light red wines. So you notice, you know, this is a pretty light red color. It's, it's sort of a light red brick or something. Mm -hmm. because neither of these have tons of anthocyanins in their skins, which are what give red wines their color. So as a lighter red wine, you naturally have light color in then through the aging process, because we're not adding sulfites, which hide browning in wine. Uh, most Pinot Noirs will have the sulfites added that will hide any brick colors, but by not adding those, you actually will get that color showing through. And you get a little bit more aged character that way as well. So you might start to notice some, you know, forest floor, leaf litter, tea leaf, uh, you know, tobacco and leather, you know, these sort of things that, uh, you know, wine geeks, you know, ramble on about mixed with that fruit. I don't yeah. know. It's a, it's a, it's a trippy wine. Yeah, no, I, I definitely pick up a lot of on those like warm baking spices. So definitely mm -hmm. like that cinnamon, maybe right. a little bit of the vanilla. Um, definitely like strawberry cherry. So yeah, like he was saying, those lighter kind of red fruits, which are mm -hmm. kind of classic to those varietals. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And then, I aged this again on French oak. I, I use mostly French oak, a little bit of American oak, but uh, most of my wines are French oak focused. And then along with that French oak, I actually used a pretty significant amount of cherry wood on this wine. This is a wine that because it has so many dominant cherry flavors, I really wanted to accentuate that with that use of the cherry wood. So just, it, it accentuates this cherry almond note in the wine, the these use of other woods, you know, other wineries only use oak, but coming from a woodworking family, I have three brothers, Jerome, who actually is usually my co-host uh, on here and hosts a lot of our virtual tastings. But these days he's right in our whole, you know, shipping and production department. So we give him the weekend off. You know, he, he worked in the woodworking industry. My other two brothers, both currently, uh, one owns his own shop, another one runs a shop. So they both are woodworkers, make furniture basically for a living. Um, and when I went into the wine industry, looking at barrels naturally it's like the only major influence of wood in the wine industry it's like why do you only use oak we use all sorts of cool woods in the wine industry and other hardwoods especially like cherry and maple and you know hickory and stuff seem like they would be great in terms of they smell great when you're sawing them they smell great if you use them for smoking and barbecuing and so on so i started experimenting with them and cherry works really great in light red varieties like this so um, I'm curious if people are spotting that in the wine. I, I personally notice it, but I also am the one who added it. So I'm very aware of its influence on the wine. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, let me know if you guys are spotting that in the wine. And then in terms of other notes on the, the making of this wine, you know, I, I did add a pinch of Brazilian Ambarana wood, which not much, but just a pinch. This is something new to this vintage. So folks have tried the previous vintage. This is the 2019 vintage. And on this one, this, this Brazilian wood is used in a Brazilian sugar cane spirit called cachaca. And they use about 12 different Brazilian woods that are pretty much only existing in Brazil. And this one in particular is the most aromatic of those woods they use. It can choose a huge like cinnamon, vanilla, 
borderline medicinal kind of like cherry vanilla characteristic um i mean vanilla uh, cinnamon characteristic so it's it's crazy aromatic so just a pinch of that and that way it lifts that cinnamon vanilla note in it but you'll notice it's not a super tannic wine it's overall pretty smooth not heavy not this long dry finish it's, it's got some lift to it some crispness but then the finish is quite easy as far as pairings go my music pairing for this is since this is a blend of of two different varieties and it's kind of a quirky pairing you don't see this normally pinot noir is traditionally from burgundy grenache is from you know the rhone valley specifically in the southern rhone used in their blends and they almost never are seen together in a blend so it seemed like you know two kind of quirky characters in the same blend so i chose the song in spite of ourselves by john prine and iris dement if you haven't heard that song it's a super fun song of this couple that just seemed like a total odd couple but it and they're just super eccentric throughout the whole song it's a really fun song uh and the life pairing for this is relaxed you know summer bonfire you're maybe at the beach or out camping with friends you know in the the high sierras you know relaxing in a mountain environment by a campfire maybe a friend's playing a guitar and you guys are sharing some wine some good conversation on the campfire this is that wine for me but not like a winter camping where it's like rainy and you're miserable this is like summertime bonfire relaxing you know uh, this just doesn't feel like like a heavy wine for me you know this isn't your winter red Mm -mm. yeah and both of these yeah are very light varietals too so they're just yeah. kind of easy drinking light red just to kind of uh, clock yeah. exactly so these kind of you know pinot noir grenache sangiovese gamay tend to be lighter reds that you maybe would want to have in summertime and even chill down a bit you can drink this a bit chill almost like it's like a heavy rosé but you know just as a lighter red and then my food pairings for this this goes this this entire recipe is basically an exact dish from an awesome restaurant in Sacramento, a Michelin noted restaurant uh, called Vocalis. And they pair this with jerk quail, slightly spicy, with cornbread and ginger stuffing, black bean puree, carrot and cilantro slaw, and micro cilantro. So, yeah, you know, just cook that up at home. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a great variant. You, got, you guys can all do that, right? Um, but really, this goes great with any kind of lighter meats. Um, or if you're vegetarian, this goes really well with uh, cheeses in general, but particularly sharp cheddar, Asiago, or any other kind of saltier style cheeses like Parmesan or something. This also goes really well with olives and pickled things, just because it has that kind of like a little bit of earthy, leafy funkiness, you know, that goes with a uh, pickled stuff well. Um, okay, I think that, oh, right, I almost forgot my literary pairing. Uh, I don't know if it's so much as a literary pairing as, as it is just a quote I like from Russell Brand from his book entitled My Bookie Wook. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. and he says, we all need something to help us unwind at the end of the day. You might have a glass of wine or a big delicious blob of heroin or a joint to silence your silly brain box of its witterings. But there has to be some form of punctuation. Or life just seems utterly relentless. <laughs> so I think, you know, I, I've had people say, oh, that's like a sad quote. I'm like, oh, I didn't think of it as sad. I thought it was more as like, yeah, we all need a break. You know, it's like life can just be like work, home, work, home. And just break it up with like something. And for some people that's, you know, <laughs> including uh, apparently, uh, you know, Russell Brand, uh, he was an alcoholic for a while. So for some people that's like just wine or read or drugs. But that can be hiking. That can be yoga. That can be exercise. Uh, something that's like a punctuation, a break from the, the routine. You know, breaking your life up and doing something different. Whatever makes you relax um, in a nice balanced way. Yeah. <laughs> don't, go, go, don't go down Russell Brand's uh, early life path. Uh, so, yeah. So, that is the, uh, the third wine here. Our, our first red. We have two more wines coming up here. But uh, next we have Debbie Duval, who is the WCA board member and expert owl rehabber. And she's going to discuss the importance of owls in maintaining the environment and the special benefits of using them for eco-friendly rodent control in vineyards. So um, that is something that's really cool. We have our own small vineyard, but we haven't yet looked into uh, you know this kind of rodent control, but this is something you do see in vineyards as an organic alternative to you know other ways of controlling uh, rodents is to actually use owls. So uh, without further ado, I'll let uh, maybe hop on up. 
Welcome, Debbie. Hi, thank you for having me. And um, as Jennifer stated earlier, I also would like to thank Kevin and Bryce both for um, helping us and partnering with us to raise money for our organization and help us continue our efforts to um, give wildlife a second chance out there. Without people like you guys and organizations that step in to help us, um, it would be hard for us to continue our work. Um, we are pretty much 80 to 90 percent uh, funded by donations just from the public and from organizations like yourself and we get very little grant money we do apply for them when we can but other than that it's pretty much funded by um, donations um, just from the public and organizations like yourself um, so we did bring our barn out tonight um, since this was a, a wine tasting event and um, we do um, Barn owls, we have um, several requests request every year for barn owls to be released at some uh, vineyards. Um, we do a release every year in Clarksburg, and we've done some in Cape Hay Valley at some vineyards down there in the past. And they really like having the barn owls out there, especially the barn owls, because their diet is almost 100% rodents. Um, other owls will eat rodents as well, but um, the barn owl is notorious for eating mice. And um, a family of barn owls in one year can consume over 4,000 mice a year. So that's a, a pretty good hit on the mouse population out there. Um, one little baby owlet a night can eat 10 mice alone. Um, and the barn owls will have two broods a year, which is nice. And uh, so again, a bigger hit on the mouse population and they can have as many as um, 10 to 12 eggs a year. And hopefully if they all make it and hatch, that's you know, 10, 12 baby owlets out there eating 10 per owlet a night of mice. So um, very good instead of um, using the pesticides out there and uh, the poisons and the dusting and all that. The, uh, the, the vineyards we've released at, um, they've seen a significant um, benefit to having the owls out there. They've created the owl nest boxes to encourage them to stay around. Um, they have um, not had to use any kind of poison control. Um, so they, they're really a great benefit to the area. And, um, but this is the more common, this is, like I said, is the barn owl. Um, this year we raised 144 um, different species of owls. Uh, mainly it was divided between three species, the barn owl, the great horned owl, and the western screech owl. Um, out of those 144, 71 have been released. So it, that's a pretty good uh, release rate. A lot of them come in pretty severely injured and, and just don't make it. So, um, so we're keeping the population going out there and uh, we hope to continue um, to release at wineries and we're looking forward to coming out to your place as well okay. and release some owls. So yeah, again, thank I you. I love that, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> what a cute owl. Thank you. <laughs> What was the owl's name again? Uh, this um, owl is Athena. Athena. Yeah, and we've had her so about eight years. Um, she's a surrogate now. She um, raises a lot of the foster babies that we get in. Um, she came in as an imprint. Somebody found her in the backyard um, during the day. They were concerned she was injured. Um, they went back in the house to make a phone call, and she followed him in. She flew in the house and landed on the couch and um, <laughs> thought she was home so, <laughs> yeah, friendly. so she's not very releasable being so friendly yeah yeah so. awesome thank you so much thank you i think she left you a present yeah, I saw that. <laughs> 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 oh our our casas <laughs> <Su -casa. laughs> <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> Um, so yeah, we're a natural winery, very natural. Well, you know, we just, <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's so awesome. You know, I, I really like the idea of using a natural ecosystem based, um, farming and controls because a lot of agriculture has gone down this really terrible road where, you know, when you look at how farming was done for most of human history, it makes me laugh that most farmers, you know, when I, when I tell other winemakers and vineyard owners that I'm doing only organic, organically grown wines, they go, oh, what's the big deal about organic? Like, you know, what's wrong with the stuff we're doing now and everything? Like, why don't you just do traditional farming? I'm like, traditional farming? Like, that is such a myopic viewpoint because, like, there has been this, like, 70-year span of human history from, like, 70 years ago to now that we've used all these chemicals. And for the entirety of human history before that, 
we farmed without all these, you know, petroleum based sprays and poisonous chemicals that were thrown out. You know, they, they used some stuff. It was more natural stuff that they sprayed through the vineyard. If they sprayed anything at all, it was more about compost and ecosystem management, canopy management and natural controls, you know, encouraging animals in the vineyard, encouraging a natural ecosystem balance. So you had a nicely balanced vineyard and, and utilizing owls, utilizing this, this great controls of, you know, mites and spiders in vineyards that you can use. Um, actually other spiders for you can use ladybugs so you can actually manage the ecosystem in your vineyard through natural you know biological mm -hmm. you know ecosystem based stuff you don't have to just like poison the environment and we've just gotten lazy with it with a with modern way of farming so uh so thank you guys for releasing a bunch of owls out there and helping <laughs> people avoid spraying terrible chemicals um so cool the next wine is going to be the um v7 da vinci's wings zinfandel and i want to point out a couple of you guys we had a misprint on some of our stickers we noticed kind of late that some of you it might say v7 da vinci's wings cab Sauv on your actual bottle it is the zinfandel rest assured we definitely gave you the zinfandel there's just a misprint on the labels on a couple of them um but the website and all the sheets and stuff say the zinfandel so you're good um so this is an organic and biodynamic zinfandel from El Dorado County from Narrowgate Vineyards, a really awesome vineyard and winery. They make their own wines as well. And um, to explain that a little bit, this is not only organic, which we've been talking about already, but this is also biodynamic, which is a kind of farming, which is like organic taken to the next level where they utilize the ecosystem theory and more animal based um, stuff where they, you know, for their compost, they use fertilizer from animals they have there on the property. They let their chickens wander through the vineyard and, and peck around, you know, and, and that's some, some natural bug control and it opens up the soil. And so they utilize the environment. If they're going to spray, they spray using natural things growing on the property that have natural, uh, controls of, you know, for, for fungus and mold control, they utilize things from the vineyard, like chamomile and, and these different mixtures. So it's a really cool form of organic farming. And then they also do some really interesting stuff where they utilize moon cycles and they plant and harvest according to the moon cycle and the effect that has on the plants and whether there's going to be a lot of things pulling upwards through the plant uh, during different parts of the moon cycle or down into the roots during different parts of the moon cycle. So it's a sort of pseudoscientific thing where this theory of farming was based on some really ancient theories that were kind of pre-scientific. But a lot of it makes sense scientifically, and some of it doesn't. But it's a really interesting system of farming. I don't know. Have you, have you uh, tried a bunch of uh, biodynamic wines? It's well, kind of a trippy thing, right? Uh, about two or three weeks ago, I actually went out to, to Narrowgate Vineyards myself just to try some of their wines. And, yeah, they have a lot of the same kind of winemaking style, natural wines, no sulfite yeah. wines that they do, um, you know, pet gnats and stuff. Um, sweet, so, sweet. yeah, it was really cool to check that out as well, just to see where we source the, the grapes from and see how they make the wines um, from the same grapes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they have a really cool style of their own. Frank, the Frank Hildebrand, the owner out there, really kind guy. He and his wife Tina are, are just wonderful people and make some really cool wines. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so yeah, so this is a Zinfandel from their vineyard. It being higher elevation and grown this way, you tend to get that higher elevation means cooler nights and a little cooler temperature. So it makes for a wine that is a little bit more spicy than your normal Zinfandel. Some Zinfandels from hot regions at lower elevations, like Lodi, for example will be super jammy, like blackberry jam, blackberry pie. And we have a Zinfandel like that, actually, from a lower elevation vineyard. But this one being from a higher elevation vineyard, especially with that organic and biodynamic influence, you get way more spice, whether it's, you know, black pepper or, you know, more of that tea leaf, uh, tobacco, you know. When I say tobacco, by the way, I'm, I'm talking about like pipe tobacco before smoked, you know, that like earthy leafiness. And, you know, just all of those sort of spice components to go along with the blackberry. I've sometimes described this as being like blackberries if you're actually out there at the blackberry bush and you're like trampling over the bush to get to the berry. So you've got like the, the smell of these red berries. All the bramble and stuff. Yeah, exactly. With, yeah, the herbaceous kind of, um, kind of savory herb almost in there as well. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah you almost want to say like herbs de Provence. Yeah. Uh, if you can say it, <laughs> it's, it's hard to pronounce, but yeah, or like the Italian herbs or French, or, you know, that, that herbal note for sure. And then this was aged on a little bit of new French oak, about 30% new French oak. And then the rest was used French oak. And in addition to that, this was also aged on a little bit of cherry wood, but mostly on maple wood. And that maple brought in this maple molasses characteristic that helped 
just enhance that richness. Some people get a little chocolate characteristic in this. Some people get more of that maple molasses note. Uh, you know, you get the different aspects of that. I don't know, do you get those different woods in this? Yeah, I would say I get a little bit more of that kind of like cocoa and then like a touch of the maple in there as well. Because um, usually that maple, like with some of the other wines that we make, that maple wood kind of comes through a little bit more. This one's mm -hmm. a little bit more subtle. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a little bit more focused on like the cocoa aspect for me, for, for those kind of oak flavors. Yeah. Yeah, I like that because I mean, blackberry and chocolate, that makes so much sense together. It's delicious. When this wine was younger, it was almost harsh. It was like really high acid. And the tannins were younger and harsher. Mm -hmm. um, but as it's aged, it's really softened out. And I feel like it is still, it's not like a light wine. But after, you know, the first sip is like, oh, that's still a pretty big wine. But after a sip or two, it starts getting really smooth and nicely balanced. There's just a lot going on there. Mm -hmm. So um, in addition to yeah. the flavor pairings here, let's see. I've got some music pairings and all this other stuff. Um, yeah, so I paired this with Old Man by Neil Young. Which I think this is actually left over from my Father's Day pairing. Um, but that is a really good, deep, thoughtful song. If you guys haven't heard Old Man by uh, Neil Young. Uh, but other than that, <laughs> um, my uh, literary pairing for this is from John Steinbeck and his book Travels with Charlie in Search of America. And the literary pairing is, I have always lived violently, drunk hugely, eaten too much or not at all. Slept around the clock or missed two nights of sleeping. Worked too hard and too long in glory or slobbed for a time in utter laziness. I've lifted, pulled, chopped, climbed, made love with joy and taken my hangovers as a consequence, not as a punishment. Um, so I'm a big fan of John Steinbeck. Uh, some of his uh, early stuff uh, where he had actually, you know, he wrote Cannery Row and some of these other books where he had traveled. Um, he had lived in the Carmel area. And he had actually been really close friends with a marine biologist friend, doctor, you know, PhD in marine biology and, and did some tide pooling research up and down the California and Baja Mexico coasts. And the log from the Sea of Cortez was something that really inspired me when I was younger. So I'm, I've always been a big fan of John Steinbeck. Um, in fact, that book is what made me initially study wildlife, fish and conservation biology before I studied wine. I almost graduated with that degree, which I learned earlier that Jennifer is also a, uh, is a graduate of the UC Davis Wildlife Fish and Conservation Biology Program. So um, yeah, so John Steinbeck's always been a big influence on me. And in this case, it's, it's a rare quote from John Steinbeck about living crazy and getting drunk. So it's <laughs> <laughs> good pairing. Uh, we actually had a question on this one. Um, oh, cool. Kelsey asked again, um, um, does this one go through a malolactic secondary uh, fermentation? Yeah. So all of our red wines go through that malolactic, but because, so basically what she's referring to you for, uh, to, for those of you who aren't as familiar with uh, some of the you know, behind the scenes winemaking terminology is malolactic fermentation is the secondary fermentation that happens in some, but not all wines. So the primary fermentation is how we get alcohol. It's yeast turn sugar into alcohol. Uh, they also produce carbon dioxide and some other stuff as a byproduct, but the really important thing is sugar to alcohol. This is literally the same process that happens in beer, wine, hard cider, you know, any alcoholic product starts as a fermentation from sugar to alcohol. That's the base thing, magical thing. Um, <laughs> and so after that fermentation is done, or sometimes sort of concurrently, bacteria, particularly the, the class of bacteria called lactic acid bacteria, convert malic acid to lactic acid. So it's actually a fermentation of an acid, which is kind of kind of crazy. It's like, wait, but okay, if the fermentation is sugar to alcohol, well, this is an acid fermentation. And what it does is it actually converts malic acid, which is the acid in apples, into lactic acid, which is the acid that you get in creams and butters and yogurt and so on. So it softens wine and it gives it like a creamy buttery quality. And you know, short question, long answer. Yes. <laughs> long story short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, most reds go through malolactic fermentation and most barrel aged whites as well because mal uh, lactic acid bacteria and malolactic uh, fermentation will occur kind of naturally through the natural bacteria that exist just in the air and on the grapes and in the barrels. So if you just, if you barrel age a wine, it will tend to happen naturally. And since I'm not adding any yeast or bacteria like from a package because everything I'm doing is organic and natural, the malolactic fermentation occurs through the natural wild lactic acid bacteria, 
which means that it's a little less vigorous. You know, it's not like from a lab, so it's just, it's not like selected for strength. It just kind of slowly happens and naturally. So all my wines after fermentation age all the way until the next spring or summer, and I bottle them up. So it kind of varies wine to wine. Um, they may only go through a partial malic fermentation. So I give all that explanation, probably just say yes, but part. <laughs> um, <laughs> Great question. Yeah, great question. Great question. Yeah. Um, and that more or less finishes. Oh, gosh. Food pairing. I, yeah, food pairing. <laughs> um, so I have written down here uh, steak, shiitake mushrooms, stir fry, and dark sauces. So I think this having kind of a, a weight to it um, and a de depth and darkness to it, I think meat and darker sauces are a natural pairing for this. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff to go with this. Do you have any other thoughts off the top of your head? Um, really, really like the, the shiitake mushrooms, but yeah, just anytime you're grilling, you're grilling mushrooms, but like pre-soaking them with like a soy sauce or a mm -hmm. Worcestershire, yeah. um, any kind of like meaty, savory sauce um, and pre-soaking those in it is just going to add kind of that umami flavor of the mushrooms and make them more meaty yeah. to kind of replicate meat um, per se or even pair with the meat. Yeah. Um, it'll make it go even better. Or you're, actually, even you can soak them in the wine themselves too before cooking, Ooh, um, and that'll just add to the dish's complexity even more. I like that. Yeah, getting all those spice components and depth into anything. So you could infuse that. I mean, we're talking mushrooms or shoe, and they already have so much umami and earthiness. Yeah. But really, any mushroom or even like something that soaks up flavor, like tofu, mm -hmm. you know, for, again, for the vegetarians. Because for meat eaters, I feel like this is also something which I don't have written down here, but I think this is a wonderful lamb pairing. Because mm -hmm. this has some of those sort of almost Indian spice components that I think go really well with lamb, like cumin or cardamom or something. Mm -hmm. It has some of that characteristic in it naturally. Um, so, so yeah, that is, uh, that is that one. Oh gosh. Okay. This is definitely from the father's day event, <laughs> but since it's on my sheet and I'm basically like, um, anchor man, you know, I just read whatever's on the teleprompter in front of me. I'm going to read my <laughs> dad joke pairing for this. Yeah. So the dad took care of this. So um, there was a spider in the in the bedroom, and my uh, my wife told me that like you know I want I want to kill the spider because she's like freaking out. But she's like, no, you need to take the spider out. Like, don't kill him. Take him out. So I took him out. We went out, had a few drinks. He's a nice guy. He's a web designer. <laughs> We're working on our studio I'll audience here all night. to have the, the laugh track. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> that's why I call them bad dad jokes. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, we're uh, just about ready for the fifth wine. And you guys can... Somewhere here. Yeah. Yeah. You can pour the fifth wine, the L8 Wanderlust Red Blend, uh, into your glass. But while... You're starting to sip on that and uh, enjoying that. By the way, it is a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Barbera, and Zinfandel. And I chose this blend because I think it was just a really good mix of, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon providing the backbone. It's it's a more full-bodied red wine. It comes from the Bordeaux region of France, and it's a backbone of the great Bordeaux blends. And then Barbera is a grape from northern Italy that provides a lot, a little more crisp, fresh fruit acidity. And, you know, this nice blackberry, um, you know, raspberry, cherry kind of bright fruit characteristic. And then you bring in Zinfandel, which it was my, 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 more, my more jammy style Zinfandel. So I brought in this blackberry jam component. So you get a wine that's really intense. It's got a lot of flavor, dark fruit, rich like vanilla chocolate notes, and even a little bit of spice and smoke, but which is overall balanced and smooth. And that's the nice thing about blends is they tend to be really balanced and smooth. Before I get too into that. I just want to give a little intro so you know what you're sipping on. We're going to tell you guys a little bit about, well, the wine kits that a lot of you guys are already having in front of you, but tell you about some of our upcoming stuff, as well as our wine club subscriptions, just for a minute or two, give you a little intro to that, and then we'll return to the wine. So here I have in front of me our wine tasting kits. So those of you at home have these little mini bottles, and uh, you know, I'm sorry, we actually just added our actual wine labels on the mini bottles as of like a few days ago. So these aren't on the ones you guys have at home, but for all future shipments, it will not only have the identification of the wine, but it'll have our beautiful art from Michael Candlebear and Robert and Shana Park Harrison on the mini bottles. But you can purchase, no matter what, it's always five wines for these virtual tastings. And you can either get the mini tastings, which is about half a glass of wine each, 
And by the time you're done with it, you'll have had about a third of a bottle of wine. You can still drive legally. You know, that's a really nice amount for a, a kind of a wine tasting, right? Then we have our larger tasting, which this is really great for, you know, um, lushes and people like me who just really enjoy drinking a little more wine. It's a very, uh, very nice amount, four ounces, about 100 milliliters. And this is just short of a glass of wine each. So this is more, you know, the evening where you're uh, having a nice uh, night at home. You know, you and your lover just want to drink some wine and not drive anywhere. That is a really good, uh, you know, tasting size. It also works really well if you want to share that. You know, if you're more of a drinker, you each get one. If you want to share that, that works as well. Or another great option for that is what we call our two-person pack. It's sort of the date night option. It's two of the mini taster packs plus a full bottle of our L8 Wonder Less Red Blend. Well, it actually, it does vary tasting to tasting, but it's often that one. And that way you each have your own mini tasters, but you got a bottle to just kind of relax and enjoy afterwards. So that's a really good option as well. And then last but not least, we have our five bottle option. And that's for people who really just want to, want to see the thing in its full original style in the full bottle. And, you know, we only have three up there, but it's normally the full five. That's because we've been uh, we've been drinking at those. So, uh, yeah, my staff tasting is four o'clock. Uh, end of day, we, we do a little drinking. And then over here, off the side of it, we have our subscription boxes. So we have a wine club, but our wine club is a little different. We do monthly subscriptions and we ship it to your door. You get one, two, or three bottles of wine along with a locally handcrafted gift. So this ranges from uh, adult coloring books from a local artist, Karen Chen, locally made jewelry from a local artist. We have locally made hot sauce, locally made candles, locally made soap. We have you know, these wonderful things that light up. Um, so we've got lots of fun stuff here that come along with your wine delivery. Um, and that's just a free add-on as a, a you know, special way to help promote local things we believe in, local artists, local uh, artisans, and you know, working with nonprofits as well as we're doing today. So cool, I will return to that wine now. So as I was saying earlier, the, um, the you know, this is a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Barbera and Zinfandel, really smooth and full bodied. After blending those three together, they were all aged on, again, French oak, but in this case, also a little American oak. Because while French oak is a little bit more subtle and it gives really nice vanilla, you know, vanilla, clove, caramel notes, American oak can bring in like a really strong amount of vanilla and, and coconut. So it really adds like a sweetness to the wine almost, like a perception of sweetness. There's no actual sugar coming from American oak, but it makes the wine taste sweeter, which you probably are nosy on this wine. Uh, Mm, that's the beer talk. <laughs> so in addition to that French and American oak, we used a little bit of charred bourbon barrel style whiskey oak, which is actually American oak, which has been lit on fire briefly. <laughs> so it's actually been charred. That gives the wine really intense vanilla and smoky spiciness. So there's sort of dark roast coffee, you know, dark chocolate and smoky bourbon whiskey component. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you get that in this wine? Yeah, uh, this one I notice a lot more of the different because it does have quite the gamut of, of different woods in it. But yeah, the whiskey oak mm -hmm. really comes through with this one because they do char the, the oak a lot more with whiskey than yeah. the wine barrels. Um, and that's kind of the first thing I noticed with this one is uh, more of the kind of these oak derived flavors and aromas. Um, and then where the background fruit flavors come in are like those fig kind of oxidized or like dried fruits. Mm -hmm. Almost, you know, pl uh, a plum, yeah, yeah, fig and all this. I like that fig reference because I think this wine, well, it has some beautiful fresh fruit. It also has some seriously like aged fruit or, you know, yeah, fig comes to mind. Some people say this wine tastes a little bit like pork to them, pork. like a dry pork. You know, you have this mm -hmm. like more aged fruit characteristic. It's almost dried fruit or figs. Um, so, yeah, some, some cool flavors going on. There's a lot going on there. And then some pairings for this guy. All right, this wine is called the LA Wanderlust Red Blend. So most of my pairings kind of play off of that. You know, I think right now, some of my favorite pairings are actually from Metallica. So I have two Metallica pairings here. <laughs> One is Whiskey in the Jar, which is a cover of an old uh, Irish drinking song. And because this was actually, you know, aged on some whiskey oak, but 
you know, you could also pair this with Metallica's Wherever I May Roam in Wanderlust. So, you know, depending on your, your Metallica options. preference. So many yeah. options. Yeah. 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 It's great. So, so many. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I could go on. I have like 10 movie pairings for this <laughs> bunch of travel <laughs> songs. Yeah, people ask me sometimes where, where the names come from, you know. And Wanderlust in particular came from, you know, I travel a lot making wine all around the world. And it really drove home for me that wine is one of these really cool things that connects us to the wider world and reminds us that there's all these countries out here, you know, uh, whether America is never one or not, <laughs> we are just one of many, many countries and cultures out there. So remembering the value and the beauty of all these different cultures and through wine connecting with them, you know, you drink a, uh, you know, a Barbera and you can really think about the you know Northwest Italian countryside and the hills there and the culture of, of the people who drank this. And then same thing with Cabernet Sauvignon, you think of France and Bordeaux. And I think wine is this great portal to the world. Mm -hmm. So the idea of wanderlust, this is a wine that's from, you know, grapes from a bunch of different countries all coming together into one blend and uniting. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's that, that's that name. Um, so yeah, I could tell a story like that for each of them, but they are kind of inspired by different things like that. So, other than the music pairing, some food pairings for this. You know, I, I have a bunch of notes, but the core for this for me is like, you know, anything kind of grilled or smoked, anything on the barbecue, whether that's steak or burgers or mushrooms or just grilled veggies, I think anything off the grill is awesome on this. Yeah, and to kind of like bounce off of that, because um, I think normally, well, with my limited knowledge of smoking foods, but like usually you rehydrate the, the oak chips or the wood chips that you use so they don't burn. Um, but you could actually use the wine to soak the chips in so that, you know, they do the oh, more of cool. the smoldering, but then you have the wine, you know, incorporated into the, the smoky flavor as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I dig so it. That was a fun addition to the, to the smoking session. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of smoking session. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So other food pairings for this. I also note that this goes really well with pepperoni pizza or um, whole grain crackers with a creamy mild cheese and jam. So that's like that creaminess with that jamminess in this wine. Totally makes sense. Uh, I Actually, like that was just a theoretical pairing and then we actually did it one day. And it was really good, especially with like a peppery style jam. You know, mm -hmm. those ones will be like habanero, blackberry or something. Um, really good with this. And also Trader Joe's sells these things called PB&J bites. They're <laughs> peanut butter and jam, it's peanut butter and jelly bite-sized chocolate covered things and it was insanely good with this wine actually as like a dessert pairing uh and back to the pepperoni pizza actually uh, there was, a, there was a, a a pizza shop in chico that they had um pizza but you could uh over at their condiment station they had a pepper or a powdered rosemary um and so i've since made that from the house i just whenever i see a rosemary plant i clip off some of it let it dry powder it and then you see yeah, i putting that on top of the pepperoni pizza adds a little bit more herbaceous uh, flavor to the pepperoni uh, Sounds pizza, good. which is even better. Pairing. That little herbal note along with, because I think this is a wine that has so much richness. It's like really good with something that's rich like pepperoni, mm -hmm. but having that herbaceous note just adds that extra element to play off some of the like yeah. the more spicy components in the wine and herbal notes. Definitely, yeah. I dig it. Um, all right, so we're gonna we're gonna finish. Right. Oh, okay. Life pairing. I have two last pairings here. Um, the life pairing is. Again, playing off of that um, wanderlust note. So being adventurous, traveling, camping under the stars with your lover, good conversation by the campfire, you know, barbecuing with friends, really being outdoors and traveling. So obviously, we, you know, it's harder to travel these days, but camping, going hiking by the campfire, any of that kind of vibe, whatever you can do to get out and, and wander a bit. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, the literary pairing. So I'm a little torn here. What do you think? Should I go with Dr. Seuss, Dr. Who, or Douglas Adams? <laughs> what, what, is the, what does the studio audience say? <laughs> Dr. Who? Dr. Who? Oh, All right. Dr. We're going to do Dr. Who. Oh, yeah. I mean, how can I not do Dr. Who? <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> I, the reason I hesitate is because I actually have two Dr. Who quotes here. <laughs> uh, so... We're going to say um, this, okay, the quote from Doctor Who is, when you're a kid, they tell you it's all grow up, get a job, get married, get a house, have a kid, and that's it. But the truth is, the world is so much stranger than that. 
It's so much darker and so much madder and so much better. The world's a crazy place, but uh, you know, we're not meant to live a simple, straightforward life. We're meant to wander and explore and, and see the world around us, you know, and, and connect with the wider world, the natural world. Don't get too caught up in your city life, you know, like remember all this that's out there. So yeah, that's how I start to feel after about five drinks. Of wine. <laughs> <laughs> glasses of wine. <laughs> so um so again, thank you all so much for joining us for this. Um, that concludes our fifth wine here and our wine tasting. Uh, thank you everyone for purchasing these kits, for supporting this wonderful local cause. And uh, thank you, Bryce, for joining me on air and bringing those you. wonderful glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and um, John glasses, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and thank you, uh, Debbie and Yennefer, for, for joining us and uh, bringing those beautiful animals and for doing everything you guys uh, do for the community and for, you know, these wonderful animals. And we'll see you guys next time. We have some wonderful tastings coming out. Check out the website, voluptuarewine.com. We'll see you guys again in two weeks. And... Have a good rest of the night. See you then. Thank you.